welcome to the 2014 Sigurd Olson Lecture Series. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the 15th year we've run the Sigurd Olson Lecture Series, which is in honor of Sigurd Olson, who was a dean of Vermilion Community College for many years. Um, he was a remarkable guy, one of the great people who came out of Ely, uh, and remarkable in many ways. Um, he was a great writer of the natural world. Um, he was uh, a nationally known and a very important conservation leader throughout the country in many levels. Uh, but he was also a wonderful teacher and dean. He moved to Ely in about 1923 and taught biology in the high school. Uh, and then moved over to what was then called the junior college, where he also taught in the natural sciences and ultimately became dean of the junior college. Um, he was a wonderful teacher, but he was even more importantly a wonderful mentor to many young men and women who went through Ely Junior College. Uh, and he inspired many people uh, to study and respect the natural world. Uh, many people who went on to do great research in the area of wildlife and natural resources and to become citizen advocates for the natural world. Um, it, the, the objective of the Sigurd Olson Lecture Series is to bring to Minnesota and Wisconsin leaders in the conservation and environmental world uh, who have done great things, and in particular who have, tough, who have solved tough conservation problems. The people who have come to Minnesota have solved these problems both throughout the United States and also throughout the world. This year we're honored to have with us Mike Clark. Uh, Mike Clark uh, was the executive director of Greater Yellowstone Coalition twice in the 1990s and again in the late uh, first decade of the 20th century, or 21st century. He just stepped down, retiring once again from Greater Yellowstone Coalition last summer after five years. The Greater Yellowstone Coalition is the largest environmental group in the interior west. Its service area is about 20 million acres, the largest intact ecosystem in the lower 48 states. The heart and soul of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition is the Yellowstone National Park, which is 2.2 million acres. Um, when Mike was executive director in the 1990s, his biggest challenge that he tackled was something called the New World Mine. This was a gold mine that was proposed to be sited a mile from the boundary, boundary of uh, Yellowstone National Park. And tonight he's going to talk about what that mine would have meant to Yellowstone National Park and how the country confronted that challenge and that threat. And I think there are important lessons to be learned from what uh, happened in Yellowstone National Park and what could happen in the Boundary Waters if we're not vigilant. So with this, I introduce Mike Clark. Okay, so the mic is only for the video, it's not for the video. <laughs> I don't think you'll have a problem. <laughs> I would I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I came to visit uh, this community many, many years ago with my daughter and, uh, and her mother, and uh, we had a great time roaming through here. Uh, I've spent much of my life working in mining communities in Appalachia, and it was uh, really intriguing for me to come into this part of the world and visit some of the communities around here. So it's neat to be back. I want to talk to you tonight for a few minutes and then I'll answer questions as long as you want. Uh, my story tonight is about what happened in Yellowstone Park uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, first I want to talk about, about how Americans have chosen to set aside certain lands for special protection and management. And by that I mean the national parks uh, and the wilderness areas. Uh, the American economic system generally assumes that <clears throat> all of our resources are open to people who want to try to make money off of them uh, and that we should have free access to them. <clears throat> there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, one are national parks and Yellowstone was the first national park created in 1872 uh, and then the Wilderness Act uh, came along many decades later. In 1872, at the same time Yellowstone was created, the Congress also passed a law called the Hard Rock Mining Law of 1872, which opened up much of the West for mining, for gold, uh, for silver, for lead, uh, 
uh, across the, the states or the, or the territory that had not yet been uh, de uh, designated as states. So if you look across the West, about half of all the land in the West is public land still. Uh, and so how we manage those lands is of vital importance to all of us. So this is the upper falls of the great of the uh, uh, Yellowstone River inside Yellowstone Park. I want to tell a story about how uh, there was a proposal to develop a gold mine on the edge of the park. But uh, the other things sometimes get in the way. These are grizzlies, uh, three cubs, one sow. It's very unusual. That only happens in a place where the habitat is so good that the mother sow can raise those, those uh, cubs uh, successfully. It does not happen often. Uh, it has to be a lush terrain with plenty of food, and Yellowstone is that kind of a place. Forty years ago, there were only 200 of these creatures left in Yellowstone, primarily in Yellowstone Park and the surrounding area, uh, and most scientists assumed that they would be extinct within 100 years. We passed the Endangered Species Act, uh, protected these animals under that, and as a result, all of our communities around the region had to begin to change our behavior toward the bear. Uh, we had to take, take them more fully into account and not just kill them if they came out and caused a problem. As a result of those changes in human behavior, not behavior by the bears, they're still doing what they've always done, we now have between six and 700 bears living in the greater Yellowstone region. Enormously important comeback from an animal that was heading for extinction. Uh, and, a, and a great story. So Yellowstone is located primarily in Wyoming. Uh, a bit of it sticks over into Montana uh, and in Idaho. So, okay, so this is Greater Yellowstone. The red Yellowstone Park, Grand Teton National Park. The dark green, I hope you can see this, is National Forest. The yellow is BLM lands. Uh, this is an Indian reservation, the Wind River Reservation. The white are the private lands. So you can see how most of this is federal land. Uh, and the mine I'm talking about is this red dot right here on the northeast corner of Yellowstone. That's an area that in the 1860s was developed as a gold mining center um, and was an important uh, uh, region for mining uh, minerals in Montana. Over between 1860s, late 60s and 1956, when all the mines closed, it was the second most productive mining district in Montana. It's called the New World Mining District. This is what makes Yellowstone, the greater Yellowstone, so unique. These brown lines are roads, county roads, federal roads, state roads. The park is this white space in the middle. These are wilderness areas. Above it, this area here, is the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness Area, the largest high altitude wilderness area in the lower 48 states. So it extends around the top of the Yellowstone Park. And again, the mine was located right in here. Here is Jackson. I live in Bozeman, which is in here, just above my hand. Uh, Cody is back over here. Very wild, very rugged piece of the world. Less than nine people per square mile live in our region because most of the federal land does not allow people to live on it. So we have a small population. It's rapidly growing, uh, but it's small. Map of Yellowstone Park. Again, the mine I'm talking about was located right here. If you know Cook City, if you know that area, Cook City, it was located a mile away from Cook City. When the mines closed in, 18, in 19, 1956, uh, the area gradually changed from a mining community to a community marked by second homes and by tourism because one of the entrances to Yellowstone Park is right there. And so over 25, 30 years, it became a very vibrant tourist economy, much like this town experiences right now. Uh, the mining jobs all went away. There were a few prospectors that were around looking for new ore bodies, but, but basically it was a tourist-based economy. Very quiet and very beautiful. In, eight, in 1985 and 86, a Canadian company called Noranda uh, opened up operations to explore whether or not they could find gold in that area. And they were successful. 
Uh, Noranda was the second largest company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. <clears throat> it set up two subsidiaries, one called Hemlo Gold, which operated throughout the U.S. looking for gold uh, ore, and then Crown Butte Mines, which was a local entity that would mine whatever was found. And to the company's delight, they found on one mountain uh, five separate deposits of gold. The mines, when they closed down in 1956, closed their operations when they were less than 50 feet from the mother load that Narenda discovered. It was one of the richest deposits discovered in modern times in this country. Uh, and so that set off a round of uh, uh, actions by the company. They, they began to file for permits from the state of Montana uh, and from the federal government to be able to mine. <clears throat> This is the Lamar Valley, very close to the mine, very beautiful area. Can you see all that all right? I have bad eyes, so I can't really tell what's there. Uh, very beautiful. The, the Yellowstone is very much like this, very rugged, high mountains, big plains, big meadows like this. Uh, and the Yellowstone River flows through the middle of this. And we have, as I said before, bears. This is a mama sow with two cubs in the Lamar River Valley, a few miles from the mine. Uh, proposed mine, um, <clears throat> and this is a teenager playing in the snow. Uh, and uh, bears have a great sense of humor. They, they like to play like this, and they're very much like us in that regard. They take the time to enjoy where they are. We also have wolves. We brought wolves back 18 years ago. We introduced 35 wolves into Yellowstone Park, another 30 nearby. Uh, today, when you look at Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, there are 1,700 wolves roaming across those three states. Very controversial. The, all three states now allow hunting. Uh, and uh, in Idaho, for example, they're shooting them from helicopters to try to drive the population down. What's fascinating is as the wolves have moved around, they have become <clears throat> much more wary and much smarter. There's almost no predation on cattle now or on sheep in these three states. In Montana last year, wolves killed less than 50 cattle. Uh, and so the, the predation rates have been much lower than any of us thought they would be because there's so much elk and deer around. But it's still a very controversial species uh, and the battle for that goes on will probably go on for the rest of our lives. There are some people who like wolves and some people who hate them and there's not much meeting of the two. And we have <coughs> the American bison, probably the most poignant animal in our history because in the 1860s, early 60s, there were 30 million of these animals roaming across the plains into the Rockies. Within 10 years, we had killed almost all. There were 20 in 1872, there were 20 left, 1873, 20 animals left in Yellowstone Park, 26 in Texas, 15 in the Bronx Zoo. That's all. Most of those animals were brought to Yellowstone and were protected the herd there now uh, totals about 4,300 animals. A lot of controversy about that. Uh, some people think they're too many. When they wander out of the park <coughs> looking for food in the winter, uh, the state of Montana has over the last 25 years killed thousands of them because some of the bison carry a disease that will infect cattle, uh, even though the disease came from the cattle originally. So big controversy. Here they are moving toward the Roosevelt Arch which is the main entrance to Yellowstone from the north. Very poignant and yet very interesting story about comeback. There are now across the country over a quarter million bison who have descended from those 50 odd animals that were protected in Yellowstone Park. So the park plays that kind of a role. It's a reservoir for, for diversity. Native cutthroat, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, a beautiful, brilliant species. Yellowstone Lake is the largest reservoir now for these trout. Uh, they're being hammered by lake trout, as you may have heard. Uh, and so we don't know about the future of these creatures, whether they will survive or not. This is another example of conflict in a national park. This line separates the national park from the forest. Yellowstone is here. Grand Teton National Park to the south. This is a Targhee National Forest. In the 1950s, Idaho politicians were worried that the park might expand to the west. They didn't want that. 
So they hatched a plot to clear cut the forest along the park boundary. And that's what happened. You can see this from outer space. Satellite photographs show that sharp line that goes from West Yellowstone uh, south uh, about 25 miles. So you can modify a landscape if you want, and we do that all the time in this country because these debates uh, are central to the way we choose to live our lives. But this is an example of the conflicts that occur in Yellowstone and around Yellowstone. And what that means is when you have a battle in Yellowstone, it has national implications. If you win, it will have an impact on every other national park. If you lose, the same thing holds true. It's uh, big time stuff. We are a mining community. And this map shows that dramatically. Yellowstone Park is this square right here with the lake in the middle. Every one of these red dots is a former mine that has largely, most of them have been abandoned, but we are, we are a region that has attracted lots of mining over the years. Uh, and and uh, a, lot of, a lot of our state money goes to dealing with how you manage those old mines. So we're familiar with the pressures uh, that come from mining. This is the mountain where the gold was found. In the foreground here is a place called Henderson Mountain. You can see these roads. These are left over from the old um, mining roads of the, of, the, of the 1950s. Yellowstone Park is right here. This area to the top is the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness, the largest high altitude wilderness area in the lower 48 states. This lake lies in the middle of it. There are a lot of remarkable things about this mountain. It's about 9,000 feet up. You can see where Timberline is right in here. The mine would have, if it had gone in, would have operated 364 days a year in an area that is known for avalanches and for snowmobilers. Snowmobilers like to come up here in the winter, and thousands of them do, and they have a game they play called highlining, where you race up a steep slope and see if you can kick off an avalanche and see if you can beat it to the bottom. Uh, a little risky, but people enjoy it. And uh, one of the interesting things was snowmobilers didn't want the mine here because they thought it would interfere with their recreation. So we had a very unusual uh, situation evolving. This is Crown Butte. This pyramid here uh, has gold on it, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's called Crown Butte, and the mine was named after it. And underneath this mountain here was that ore body, much of it lying right in here. Originally, the company proposed to build an open pit uh, mine. Uh, that, there was such opposition to that that you would have an open pit mine next to Yellowstone. They quickly abandoned that and said, okay, we will do an underground mine uh, going in from both sides of this mountain. What they didn't say in the beginning, but which became relevant, was that it was not only a gold mine, it was a copper mine. There is a huge deposit of copper uh, beneath this mountain. And the, it was, became very clear pretty quickly that if the gold mine went in, it would eventually be a copper mine because everything would be laid out ready to go. It also uh, is a part of an old volcano. And the gold and the copper is surrounded by a very, very rich uh, deposit of sulfur. So that if you mined it and you brought the ore body out uh, and you exposed it to oil, to uh, air and water, it would create sulfuric acid. What's remarkable about this mountain, too, is that it is the headwaters of three major rivers. Starting right here, and you can see the little stream, it flows to the Stillwater, which is where this lake, Stillwater River starts at this lake. So it flows down through here and north. Stillwater eventually flows into the Yellowstone River near a place near called uh, uh, Red Lodge, if you know that area. Uh, to the east is a, sm a small stream called uh, and I've forgotten the name of this, but it goes into the Clark's Fork River, which flows east toward Cody and then north to the Yellowstone. To the west, beyond this ridge right here, Miller Creek, uh, the water flows directly into Yellowstone Park. And it became clear after a lot of geological studies that Miller Creek would be affected by either an open pit or a deep mine because the water would break through the fractures in the earth and flow into Miller Creek and the acid water would then flow into Yellowstone uh, Park, and that river then flows ultimately into the Yellowstone River. So all three rivers end up 
in the Yellowstone uh, River. Um, so this became the focus of the activity. The local community was disturbed by this because the mining had long since been gone. They didn't want to have that kind of a disturbance. They came to groups like mine, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, the Wilderness Society, American Rivers, and said, can you help us uh, deal with this challenge? Uh, and they made a decision pretty quickly. They said, we're not going to mitigate. We think this location is inappropriate for mining. It's too close to the park. It's too close to the wilderness areas. It's going to have a negative impact on the waters. And so the decision was made early on to totally oppose the mine. Uh, and so they set in motion a series of strategies. They created a local group who could speak about the value of the local jobs in tourism. Uh, they created a legal team to look at how you file suit to make sure that all the laws were followed. They created a technical team of experts in water, geology, mining in general, to make sure that the company's plans was examined in great detail. And they created a media team to deal with the newspapers, to teach people, journalists, what was going on so they could educate the American public. <coughs> uh, and behind the scenes, we created two other things. Uh, one was a team of people who went out to the gold mining industry and said to them, look, this is risky stuff. Think about what would happen if you put a mine next to Yellowstone and it failed and it destroyed the interior of Yellowstone Park. Do you really want to have that as the way in which the gold, the gold mining industry is thought about? And we went out to the capital, to the investors, the bankers, and we said to them, uh, this is risky business. Uh, do you really want to put your money into this situation? And do you really want to be known as a place that financed the destruction of the world's first national park. Powerful stuff, and it had an impact. Uh, over 10 years, uh, we had hundreds of reporters come to the place to look at the mine because it became highly controversial and very public. Only one reporter in all those years wrote a positive story about the mine, and that was the Toronto Star business editor where Naranda is based. Everybody else, you take them up here to this 9,000 foot peak and you say, okay, think about this in the winter. And almost without exception, every reporter said, oh my God, this is not a good idea. So the battle went on for 10 years. I came in to run GYC in the last three years of that. And I had spent most of my life before that uh, working in mining communities in Appalachia, coal mining. I worked with the United Mine Workers. I trained the union workers in the Steel Workers Union, <coughs> excuse me, OCAW, the chemical workers, atomic workers, furniture, textile, uh, steel, in health and safety issues. And then how do you organize a union uh, to follow the law? So I came out of, a, out of a union background and out of an environmental background. Uh, and I was attracted to the battle because it was so sharply defined very different perspectives about how Americans choose to live. You can't have a modern society without mining. Uh, we have to have these metals. Uh, but you also have, I think, an idea that in some places, mining may not be the right thing to do. And that was the battle uh, on, the, on the edge of Yellowstone that we fought. Over a period of 10 years, we were able to file a series of lawsuits because when the mine company came in, we got pretty excited. This was a big load. This was a pretty neat discovery. And they rapidly wanted to, wanted to clear off some of the land and open it up for mining. And they did it uh, without having all the permits. Bad idea. Uh, they violated the Clean Water Act. And we filed suit against them. We had a wonderful law firm called Earth Justice, which is the leading environmental law firm in the country today. And they successfully fought uh, for a court victory which, in which the court said, yeah, they violated the law and they've done it openly and deliberately. And so they were fined $75,000 a day starting from the time in which they moved that dirt. And so by the time we got the lawsuit settled, the fines had totaled almost as much as the total profit 
That was projected to come from the mine. So the company started saying, hey, we may, we may have a negative balance here. Uh, and so they were, they were beginning to sweat. Uh, we also had on our side a lot of newspapers, including the New York Times. And they wrote six editorials uh, against the mine and saying, hey, folks, this is a bad idea. You ought to negotiate with the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, and they'll help you get out. We finally got a uh, negotiation uh, with the top leaders of the company in Toronto in their headquarters. And when we walked into the boardroom, which is a board a room about half the size of this, at the top, top floor of this big skyscraper, the chairman of the board turned to me and said, Clark, we got your message. And he pointed to the paper on the table. It was an editorial of the New York Times that day, naming them as culprits and saying, it's time for you to negotiate. And he said, we, we heard you. So uh, we went through a very intense day. Neither side budged. At the end of the day, we stood up uh, to leave. And we were going upstairs to meet with one of the two brothers who owned the company because one of the three people I took with me was a cousin uh, of the owner. Uh, and they and the executives knew that. And, and, the, and the relatives stood up and said, OK, we're leaving. Is there not some way we could help you stop this mine? And they said, yeah, if you can pay us what we've spent on the mine thus far to develop it, we'll leave. Well, the rule that I had, we had created was we'd been, we'd been talking to the Clinton administration all along. Uh, and I, these were three businessmen I took with me. And, and the understanding we had with each other uh, was that I would not speak at any point during the day unless I was spoken to. <laughs> that you didn't want a crazy environmentalist in the room talking to business people. These were business people talking to business people. And we took with us um, the chairman of Arm & Hammer Bacon Soda Company, which was the largest mining company in Wyoming, uh, and the relative who was an investment counselor, and the other man uh, who, whose family owned the first ranch below the mine that would have been destroyed if this mine had gone in. And the chairman of Miranda didn't know who, all, who we were. Uh, he said, well, would, would you all please explain who you are and why you're here? And without knowing, he turned to the wrong person. He turned to a man named Ed Spencer from Minneapolis. And uh, Ed uh, was a uh, Rhodes Scholar and a, <laughs> a brilliant uh, corporate executive. And Ed said, well, uh, I'm Ed Spencer. My family owns the first ranch below the mine. If it goes in, you will destroy our ranch, which we've had since the 1930s. I am the chair of the Ford Foundation. I am the chair of the Mayo Clinic. I am the former CEO of the Honeywell Corporation. My family owns Quaker Oats. You tried to make a hostile takeover of Quaker Oats 10 years ago. I suggest you talk to your staff about what we did to you when you tried that. <laughs> the room got very quiet. Uh, this, is, this is heavy stuff, you know. And uh, the chairman of Miranda said, oh yeah, I think I remember that. Next person. Uh, and so we went through the whole day. At the end of the day, the relative asked the question, what will it take to buy you out? And uh, they said, what we've got in, the, in it. And I spoke for the first time and I said, what is it? what's your price? And he said, 40 million. And I said, we can do that. Because I had a backdoor agreement with the Clinton administration that if the mine company agreed to leave, the federal people would find the money for the mine. Uh, and we agreed in 10 minutes on a deal. Uh, and uh, to their credit, every promise the mining company made to us, they followed through on. We had a little problem, though. And that was they were in the middle of a permitting process, and they couldn't stop because they would lose face, and we didn't have the money yet. And so we created uh, a private understanding that in public, they would fight to get the permits, and we would oppose them. And behind the scenes, we were together going to the White House, negotiating uh, with the White House for an agreement to close the mine and have the land turned over to the federal government 
so it could be protected. It took us six months to do that because it turned out that nothing like this had ever been done before. Uh, and President Clinton appointed Vice President uh, Gore to chair a White House level, cabinet level committee that met once a, once a month with, with secretaries of interior, agriculture, justice, all the major agencies involved to, to work out a deal. Still took them six months. Uh, but eventually uh, we did that. Uh, and I want to show you a couple things about this story. This is the landscape. The mine, uh, the ore is in that mountain. This is what reclaimed. This yellow area in the front, this photograph was taken just a couple of years ago, has now been reclaimed and restored because it was, a, it was originally full of all sorts of debris and, and gob piles. This is a meadow to the east of the mine that one of those streams flowed through, major moose habitat, grizzlies moved through here. It's the headwaters of the Clarks Fork River and a beautiful trout stream, uh, quite a lovely place. This was the most effective image we ever found. This is a company generated slide showing how they would take the waste from the mine and fill, it, fill this valley 400 feet high uh, with a, a, a waste pit uh, and build a dam and build a stream would go along the side of it. People saw the first image and then the second one and they said, no, that's not right. We don't need to do that. Um, so we were, back, we were back to the mountain. Sometimes in these situations you can have a win-win. The company was able to get 65 million dollars out of the federal government 40 million paid back their investors, 25 million went to clean up this mountain because when they bought it, they inherited the liability for cleaning it up and they had not done that. And that has now been done. The Forest Service took that money and cleaned up this mountain. It is now very little pollution coming out of it. Uh, it belongs to the American public and it's being protected forever. The mining district covers 25,000 acres of historic mining activity. All of that has been removed from future mining. So that ore body is going to sit there. We paid 65 million for it. If it were to go on the market today at the value of gold, just gold, not copper, it would be worth about $3 billion. That's now off limits. We hope forever. Uh, so sometimes you have a victory. That's me with a little more hair on my head and a little different color. The mine owner is the man on the right. The woman with her hand up uh, with me is the head of the Council of Environmental Equality, which is the White House arm uh, that deals with the environment, uh, the superintendent of the park, and of course, President Clinton. And this is the way the mountain looks now. Have you ever seen a mountain smile? <laughs> <clears throat> I went back two years ago in August. The snow fields were still there. This is not a retouched photograph, okay? This is real. Uh, and we were startled to see this face looking at us. And the ore body, the main ore body is right here, still there. Uh, this is one of those situations which I think is, is rare in modern history where the mining company was able to walk away and say to its investors, we didn't make a mine, but we didn't lose you any money. Uh, one of the amazing things that happened was in the last three or four months of the deal, Noranda decided to get totally out of gold mining. And they sold the company to a Texas firm called Battle Mountain, which at the time was one of the large and very good, I think, gold mining countries in the, in the companies in the country. And, uh, and they agreed to follow through with the deal uh, on this particular mine. We decided to hold a ceremony uh, to celebrate the transfer of the deed from Battle Mountain to the federal government. And we created a little stage on the edge of Yellowstone River uh, to have this little ceremony, invited the press and the public. <clears throat> the night before, we had a dinner for all the people involved. And Carl Albers, the uh, president of Battle Mountain, and I had a great, great evening. We had a lot of wine and had a good time. Turned out, he's not your typical mining executive. Or maybe he is. <coughs> He was the president of the Audubon Society in Houston. Loved birds. His father had been a ranger in Yellowstone Park in the 1930s. Um, and uh, he came to the meeting 
with an album of family photographs which he gave to the park that showed what his father had been as a ranger. The night before, when he had this dinner, he said to me, Mike, I have this dream. All my life, I've wanted to see an osprey come down into a river and catch a big trout and rise up and out of the air would come an eagle, a bald eagle, and hit the osprey and grab the fish. And I said, Carl, you're out of your mind. That's a nice idea. It'll never happen. <coughs> the next day, we were walking together up toward this platform, which was about three feet high. And we started up the steps. And out of the air, there came this osprey. And it swooped down into the Yellowstone River. And it got a big trout. And it was trying to make its way up. And out of the air, there came this eagle and hit it. You know, it turned upside. You've seen them. They roll over, try to protect themselves. Fish goes up. The eagle grabs it. And we're, we're walking up the steps. And Carl turns and starts beating on me. And the people who were watching thought he was attacking me. <laughs> and what he was saying was, see there, it happened. And I finally was able to talk and said to him, well, Carl, you've done some good things. Now they've paid off. Sometimes the magic happens. Uh, and uh, uh, people walk away whole, and people walk away uh, with a smiling mountain. Uh, I am not somebody who believes that mining is bad. I think it's something we have to do, and there always are trade-offs. Uh, and they have to do with what kind of mine it is. And in this situation, and, one, and ones like around you now, where is it located? And what, what impact will it have? And I think one of the things that you all need to deal with as a community is to not just talk about these choices in terms of what's happening now, but what's happening 50 or 100 years from now. One of the striking things that we face now in our society is that rural America, and I've spent all my life dealing with rural American communities, rural America is largely depressed economically. There are very few bright spots. The ones that are there are typically uh, mining towns where there's a, a, a viable ore body and it's vibrant. Energy boom towns uh, like the Bakken Fields in North Dakota, uh, the energy fields uh, south of Yellowstone in uh, Wyoming near Greenville or Pine, Pineville. Uh, and places like where I live uh, where it's federal lands and you have three things that create a vibrant economy. A good airport, snow for skiing, and trout for fishing. If you have those three things, then these communities bloom. Uh, and and uh, the rest of rural America is, is lagging behind. It's all about choices. And one of the neat things about America is that we all can have a voice in that process. Not a process simply of talking about what's happening now, but what kind of future do we want for our communities? We were able to do that uh, in this situation. Uh, and I think uh, if you were to go there today, you would find that most people in the town, the town little, little villages are not towns, would say we made some good choices um, because the, the economy is healthy. Uh, one of the studies that have come out, a series of studies recently about rural America, uh, economists have looked for the Forest Service at the impacts of Forest Service lands on local economies. Uh, and what they found again and again across the country is if you have a forest service area of more than 50,000 acres that has good attributes, beauty, solitude, uh, wilderness, wild, wild creatures, uh, those places bloom uh, and the surrounding private lands uh, increase in value. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, a reality of America because our population is growing very, very rapidly. Uh, we, we've added in this country in the last 15 years the equivalent of the population of California. And it's going to keep growing. And as it does, we're going to put more and more pressure on these wild places. And there are going to be fewer and fewer of them. And so the, the question is, how do we manage that? Uh, how do we take care of our people? How do we take care of the land? How do we take care of the wild places that are left? And uh, so I'll just, I'll just stop there, and I'll be glad to answer questions as long as you want, I'm going to leave that image up there for you. Is that a hand back there? Yeah. Um, I think it was in 1956 that uh, the 
line closed, and, and now a lot of other lines closed. Yep. That, was there a trend going on, or was it like, what was happening at that time to make them all closed? It's a very rugged uh, place, and what happened was that they were following these veins of gold back into the mountain, and the veins petered out. And they didn't have the modern ability that we do now to drill down from the top and locate the minerals. And so one by one, these mines closed out. It's a long way from a mill site. You have to haul the ore 60 to 100 miles to a mill site. It just was not economically feasible. They had very few. The, the main concerns they had in those days was safety of the miners. Um, and uh, we, we didn't know what we know now about how pollution works. The streams around there that flowed out of the mines were all dead. And uh, for the first couple of miles, even today, they still run a bright red. They're just now suckers coming back as we've cleaned up the mountain and, and reduced the amount of acid. We're starting to see a few suckers. And I think over the next 20 years, we will see smaller, we'll see other small fish in that area. Uh, but it, it takes time to, to buffer the stuff and, to, and to, dilute, dilute the pollution. But these streams are coming back. No, they, they, the, the, the companies basically closed down and walked away, and one of them left a very large unprocessed uh, uh, ore body. It was full of gold. And just recently, we, we had a situation where a company came in and said, we can, we can sweep this stuff up and we can haul it 180 miles and process it and make money. Uh, and, but it was, a, it was a very large deposit of just a pile of stuff that nobody knew anything about. But the, the companies had no assets, but the time they left, they were all broke, and they just went away. And so there was never any prosecution, and there was, I mean, in those days, we didn't have a set of, of rules that we have today. Other questions? Yes? You talked about this valley and the rivers, and you talked about well, it happens uh, all over Appalachia with in the coal fields. Uh, it happens in any place uh, in the country where you have a lot of sulfites around an ore body, and they're and those ore bodies are uh, exposed to air and water. Maybe. They were, they were uh, a lot of pollution coming out of the gold mine. There was also a lead mine about two miles away, and it was heavily polluting the streams. Uh, the, the, the map that I showed of, uh, if I can find it here, uh, of mineral, whoop, there it is. Most of these red spots are uh, former mines that are polluting the waters around them now. We've not had the money to clean up most of those mines. And so many of them are still draining into the into these streams and rivers and, and polluting stuff. This is a pretty common occurrence when you have, in our part of the world, you have gold and copper mining. Butte is the best example, the town of Butte, which is a ma uh, an amazing, magnificent city in the 1880s and 90s, 1900. Uh, the, the copper mines uh, petered out because they couldn't compete with Chile and other places around the world. That's now the largest Superfund site in the world um, and getting worse. We've been able to clean up some of it, but uh, it's an open pit about a mile deep and a mile across, and it's filling with water. In the next 20 years, the water will get to the top and it'll overflow, and all the stuff that's been cleaned up downriver will once again be polluted. So 
So these are not unusual situations in in the West. Yeah. I'm a little confused about why it was necessary to buy the company out with such a ton of public money. Um, if they tried to put a mine in an inappropriate place and the legal conclusion was it was inappropriate, why didn't they just take the loss? They could have, uh, but they wouldn't. Uh, and we wanted it to, to get over. They owned uh, the land where the gold was. What the leverage we had on them was they didn't have any level land for mill sites. All the level land was Forest Service land. And that's why they had to go through a lot of this permitting stuff. But in, in some situations, that would have been the case. What we wanted to do, though, was to gain control of the ore body so that you wouldn't have a new mine proposed 10 or 15 years down the road. And that's always a dilemma. Who controls the ore body? Because this stuff does not reduce itself in value. And so we wanted to get the ore body so that we could make sure that Yellowstone would not be threatened again in the future. And we had spent uh, millions of dollars fighting this uh, mine. We didn't want to go through that again. You can't always do that, but that, that's the goal usually when you have these conflicts on public lands. You want to, you want to take the ore body out of the hands of the mining community so this gets resolved once and for all. Otherwise, every generation fights it again. Forest Service. The land was, the land was, was bought and now is controlled and owned by the Forest Service. Okay, and, that, and they own their own uh, mineral rights? Or? Yes, they own the mineral rights and they own the surface. Okay. In many places, those are severed. Yep, uh, but we now have all of that consolidated. And then just one more thing. I know that uh, Bell Park Oaks are evacuated. Yep. 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 Well, yeah. Uh, I'm, first of all, I, first of all, I'm an English major, so you're exactly right. I am not a chemist. But there is a scale they use for uh, tolerating, for animals and plants tolerating uh, amounts of sulfur in the water. So it's a, it's a scientific scale. And if the, if the um, shifts move much, then plants and animals cannot survive. And that would have been the case uh, in this situation because that sulfur body was so large, it was one of the richest sulfur bodies ever discovered around a gold deposit. And you can't I'll give you an example of what it takes to get a, a, a wedding ring. If you think about the typical high school gymnasium, it takes that much dirt to produce one wedding, wedding, one wedding ring in an ordinary mine. Okay, so you've got to move all that dirt to get that much gold. It does not occur very often. Gold, actually, it's a, I go off on a tangent here, but gold, come, gold came from the stars as far as we know. If, there's, if there was gold in the earth as it was originally formed, it's all sunk into the middle of the earth because it's heavy. But they now think that gold came from an event about two billion years ago when uh, uh, the moon was formed, ripped out of the earth, and uh, a, a bunch of meteorites hit the earth and brought gold with it. And volcanoes can concentrate that. Gold occurs across the globe in very small amounts. Volcanoes concentrate it because they turn it into a gas and gold sticks to itself and moves up into the cracks in the earth and becomes deposits. It's really a neat, uh, neat series of theories, series of theories. But I'll get off on a tangent here and you don't want that. <laughs> yes? You said you, uh, one approach was to have these different teams and one was a scientific uh, technician or technical team. Um, are were these people volunteers and do you have money and a fund to pull them together? Because like if you wanted to do something here, we would have to raise money then to attack people to <coughs> Yes. We had both. We had, we had a wonderful uh, large number of volunteers who helped us, scientists, experts, folks like that. But in the end, we felt like we needed to have a team of people who were focusing on this particular mine with enough time to make sure they understood what was going to happen. And so we had to pay a lot of those folks. And so we went out and raised money uh, from across the country. Uh, my organization spent uh, about $2 million fighting this mine over 10 years. 
the legal team spent about $8 million. They got much of that back uh, later because of the agreement uh, for the buyout. Um, but uh, this was a very expensive campaign. Uh, it was not so in the beginning. It, it got more expensive as we went along. But what we found increasingly, uh, and this is pretty funny because it's only happened once in my life, and that is by the end of the battle, there were so many people involved that uh, they sent us more money than what we needed. And I, for the first time in my life, was able to give my staff a bonus. Uh, uh, at the end of the battle, uh, which I was told to by my board of directors. It was not something I'd ever thought about. But uh, we had people in America that sent us money. We had school kids that raised money uh, uh, with uh, little sales of food and stuff like that that were sending us money. It was quite amazing. Uh, and I think that happened because we were able to elevate the discussion to say, this is something that means that Yellowstone Park is imperiled. And nobody wanted to see that happen. And it became a symbol of a much larger way in which we value national parks and public lands in our country. Uh, at the same time, we, we never wanted to do anything that would harm the company. We wanted to stop them, but we were not out to hurt the company. We, we thought, you know, we, we understood they were doing what they were paid to do. And that was to figure out a way to mine gold. We just thought it was the wrong place. And I, I just want to say again, I, I think mining jobs are good jobs. They pay well, uh, they enrich a local community, uh, and uh, there are a lot of benefits to that. But there's some places where we just shouldn't do it because of the long-term impacts uh, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the land. And I think that's particularly true with wilderness areas and national parks. Yeah? You mentioned decent mining wages in local communities, and you're uh time working in Appalachia, uh, did you see driving communities in the coal mining area? There are, there are uh, good question, hard to answer. Yes and no. Uh, the legacy of coal mining in this country is, is a difficult one uh, because uh, to mine carbon underground exposes people to enormous dangers. And I'll give you a couple of examples, and I don't want to go off on a tangent here on you, but this, this is instructive. 1943, the first year of the World War when America was involved, there were more American miners killed in our mines than soldiers died in battle. One uh, out of every hundred miners died that year. One out of every ten suffered a serious injury. When I started working in the coal fields uh, in the early, in the 60s, there were 400,000 miners living in those communities who had been injured either directly by mine accidents or by black lung, the disease that's caused by breathing coal dust. And uh, that's a horrible legacy. We passed a black lung act which helped to help many of those miners. Uh, only 125,000 ended up being certified as having legitimately black lung and were helped. What you see in the Appalachian coal fields is a, a, a dramatic uh, example of uh, families sticking together. In many of these communities, they are impoverished. Most of them are impoverished people because they don't own the land. They don't control their lives. They're serfs, in effect, uh, in, at least they were, uh, in token to the coal mines. Uh, when miners in Appalachia get jobs, they take that money and they support all their families. It's a, it's a dispersed situation and they try to hold together. Uh, and as a result, uh, you have some communities that uh, thrive, but uh, underneath all that, uh, they are supporting a much larger network of families. It's a remarkable culture. Uh, but a, uh, uh, you, you cannot measure those communities the way we ordinarily measure wealth and uh, service in a, in a rural community. Uh, so uh, most, of Apple, most of central Appalachia has been decimated by 100 years of coal mining. That's not necessarily true in other places, but that's the pattern, uh, unfortunately, I think, in the coal fields. And I still have a lot of friends there, a lot of coal miners that I go back and visit. Uh, 
and they would be the first to tell you that this has been a long, a long struggle, and it's it's not over yet. Yeah. Um, you said that the mines <clears throat> uh, ended because they didn't have the modern technology to mine anymore, or they didn't know to go go down or whatever. What do you think in the last 25 years of the technology of mining and how that has improved and in the environmental um, standards and regulations that are implemented now? I think it's gotten much, much better. I think the mines are in general much safer uh, and the technology is much, much more improved. Uh, and that, that's good. Uh, the life of underground miners has improved dramatically in my lifetime. I spent uh, five years ago, I went to China and visited the underground mines in China. Uh, that was like going back into the 30s in this country. It was pretty brutal. Uh, so uh, we've done a good job in this country compared to other countries of improving uh, the regulations which force the companies to change what they do. And I say force because companies try to maximize profits, not maximize human benefits. Uh, and so I think uh, things have gotten much better. Uh, and I think the laws that have been passed uh, set a higher standard at every level, underground, on the surface. Uh, and we're more and more concerned about air and water and people. So uh, I think that's good. Um, but there's always, you, you have to look at every situation and say, what are the costs and what are the benefits and uh, how do we deal with this over time? These are, these are not simple questions. Uh, they, 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 uh, they haunt us. Uh, I'll give you one example of that. When we finally concluded the deal on the New World Mine, and the company agreed to walk away, the state of Montana had been against the deal. They wanted to have the mine. And they said to the federal government, we want compensation for the lost jobs. And, their, and, their, and the lone congressman, we only have one in Montana, went into a committee meeting and convinced the chair of the, of the committee that he should be given uh, some, uh, something of value. And the, what he asked for was coal. He said, there are federal coal lands in eastern Montana. Give us, the, give us some of those coal lands um, so that we can be compensated for the lost revenues, the lost taxes that would have come to Montana for these jobs if the mine had gone in. I thought it was an absurd argument, but uh, Congress agreed with him. And they gave Montana two billion tons of coal. Now, part of what was happening was that we had, a, we had a coalition of 13 different groups. One of those groups were ranchers in eastern Montana. And as the deal moved toward an uh, uh, ending, all the parties had to agree to the, to the uh, contract. The ranchers who were part of our coalition were the ranchers who owned the surface where that coal lo was located. It was a poison pill strategy. The governor was trying to destroy the deal. Uh, and so those ranchers had to choose between Yellowstone and their ranches. And they chose Yellowstone. That coal is now being marketed to China. And we are now in engaged in a major battle um, in our small communities in Montana because that coal, if it's, if it's bought and moved, will have to go through a string of small communities, most of them are less than a thousand people, with, with, a, with a train line going through it, 56 train cars a day, train loads a day, going through these communities on average. And so we're involved in a battle to try to stop that. Uh, uh, and so these things go on and on. And, and in some ways, you know, I watch that battle and I, and I say to myself, I'm responsible for that. I helped create that problem. What the rancher said, Yellowstone is more important than my particular ranch if I have to sacrifice it. That's what will happen. Tough situation. Yes? Let's fast forward over to Minnesota. Let's back up to open up the history books a little bit. Let's pick up 1950, 1956. We're in a mining district. We can all agree on one thing is room. We're in a mining district. No question about it. You look back environmental controls, environmental standards, environmental company companies, watch, you know, watchdogging, what's going on. The important thing that has to remember is there's baseline data being gathered. If we can go back and find baseline data, 
from 2030. Maybe we can open up the history books a little bit and see what we So we know where we were in 1950. We know we're going to be 50 years from now. So gathering that data with environmental guidelines, baseline data, that we're talking about air quality, water quality, mining plan, it somehow has to work somewhere to do nothing is easy to step up like you just said and I have to you know you went up and you went you were holding hands with President Clinton you won you moved ahead but can't we in a mining community with all this baseline data with all these millions of dollars of technology and qualified environmental engineering groups can't this somehow come to some result Good, good, good question. And I have to say to you, I don't know. I, I can tell you, I don't know of any mine in the world that is mining sulfites and exposing it to air and water that does not pollute the surrounding landscape. And when you look at, the, at this region with this enormous concentrations of water, uh, if, you, if you build a mine here like that uh, and it does not work, uh, it, will, it, will, it will move through this whole region in ways you can't control. So I think the burden of proof has to be with the mining company to, to show that you could put a mine in here that absolutely would not destroy uh, the wilderness area and the surrounding area. And I don't know if that can be done. I've, I, I don't know of an example around the world where, you have, where that has occurred with a sulfite mine. Uh, but I understand your concern. And I, you know, we need minerals. Uh, no question about it. Uh, the question for this particular region uh, is, is can you do it safely? Can you, can, you be, can you guarantee that? And in the West, where we have almost no water, we've not been able to do it. Here, the water presence magnifies the problem. And so, I'm, as I say, I'm an English major, okay? Uh, all I can say to you is, uh, let's, if we're going to do this, let's make sure it works, and uh, let's look for some other examples. If they're out there, I don't know where they are. Um, but I think what you're raising is a very legitimate question. Yeah? What about in the Stillwater mine in Montana, where you have environmental um, organizations working together with the mining companies and the Good Neighbor Agreement to make sure that things won't happen? It's a good example of a, of a, of a decent mine uh, that has had, had some pollution issues but every time they have, have had some, they have tried to clean them up in good faith. There's a wonderful gold mine that, that I thought was a great example in Gardner, which is on the edge of the park, small town, high altitude. It was a closed system. It was also run by a Canadian company. The, the system they used in terms of gravitation was that they would, they would uh, mine the ore, crush it, uh, put it into big tanks, and the gravity system would change the specific, specific gravity and the dust would float to the bottom, and they would reuse all that water. There was nothing coming out of the mine. They were very successful, and we had no problems with that mine. We thought it was a neat, a neat mine. What happened to them was they, they ran out of the ore body. They found another ore body a mile and a half away. They drilled a tunnel to it, and they thought they had enough gold there for 20 years. Along the way, they struck a stream of water that they couldn't plug and they couldn't stop, and it was so large uh, that they finally had to give up and walk away. And they actually came to me and said, would you like the mine? We'd like for you to manage it uh, because we want to get out of the liability to me and other people, not just me personally, but you know, to the conservation community. And we said, <laughs> thank you, that's not what we do. Uh, but they, that would have been a good mine. Well, the Polymath is proposing the same type of operation here with the um, autoclave and the recycling of the water and reusing it. And, um, I don't, I don't know the specifics. I just all I can tell you is, in my experience, when you when you disturb large amounts of sulfites, uh, you got problems on a scale that exist almost nowhere else. It's not like iron mining, where everything pretty much is stable once you put it once you put it out there. With sulfites, it's a different dynamic, and I think that's what you all have to have to have to examine. Yes. Um, number one, it's a polymath that's going to be doing the mining. Polymath is like your company that came in. Uh, number two, um, 
I, it's, you know, if it, Polymed is owned by him for Xdata, which has, everybody must know, their mining records. And then I'd like to ask you another question about um, doing robotics in mining. Isn't that becoming much more um, useful? And yeah, so I th that there is no action. You don't actually need that many bodies. You can control the mines and the equipment from Well, the the, the uh, very strong trends in mining is to reduce the number of jobs by through robotics and through better equipment. That also, uh, uh, in underground mines, uh, reduces the dangers to the miners. Um, uh, but I, I'm not familiar with, with, with that particular mine, except I know there's been talk about using big robotic trucks and hauling equipment, and that may cut into jobs. The, the job situation uh, is astounding. In, in 1945, for example, there were 600,000 coal miners in this country, mining uh, less coal than the mine today. Today, the workforce is 45,000. That's because we have improved the machinery and the techniques and we do it very, very efficiently. Uh, I don't know those, those figures would hold up for other mining situations, but certainly American, when American uh, technology is applied, uh, things get more and more efficient. Okay, what about, do you know anything about and its mining? I, uh, I, don't, I don't know details. I hear they, that their record is not very good. Uh, the, the realities are that it's really hard for any mining company to operate and not violate the law at times. And, and they, their holdings are in the Jersey Islands. Yeah. And they, there's no way you can force them to clean up or follow on and on their laws. I, I, I don't know the situation except to say that what you need to be able to do is to hold a, a company to the highest possible standards of operations. And uh, that's an imperfect world. I mean, our government does not always have the power or the will to do that. Uh, but I think that's... They have an accident, they can just leave. They can just walk away. They don't have to be Well, the, the laws now... It, the laws now are different. We, they have to put... You have, you have funding, uh, funding mechanisms in place where people have to put up bonds. Sure. There's arguments about what an appropriate level of bonding should be. But, but there are new, we do have new tools, things, the old days of rip and run are over. Um, but you, all, you always have to make sure that the, the funding or the bonding uh, rules are in place to sufficiently cover what we know about potential cost. Down the road. I mean, Down the road. Yeah. Well, Americans don't know how to deal with forever. You know, most of us, if we're lucky, we can deal with things a year at a time. <laughs> Politicians, two years, four years, six years. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have spent my life running nonprofits, and I have to do these strategic plans all the time. You know, well, anything going out more than two years is cartoon land. You know, in reality, most of us have a limited ability, and maybe it's part of our species. But but while we can predict what's going to happen, we find it very hard talk about managing things unless it's coming down on our heads. And it's, it's, a, it's a real difficult thing. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll get you in a minute. On uh, mining asteroids, and do you think that companies like mining companies and government should put some kind of funding into that ulterior? I think it's a great idea. I've wanted to go into space my whole life. <laughs> uh, but I don't think it's going to it's going to happen very soon. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, there's some interesting experiments going on now. They're sending out satellites to try to touch these asteroids and figure out what's in them. Uh, yeah, one, one part of one had come down or something. It was the size of a big lake. And uh, they were able to really you know, sample it and see what's in it. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, we found a lot of debris from asteroids or from meteorites in the desert, but I don't, I don't know about that situation. Do you have a question? Um, I'm still hungry. <laughs> um, so you had a great victory. It cost you a lot. And looking at that map, there's ore bodies totally surrounding Yellowstone National Park. Is this going to be played out a 
hundreds of times on every little, you just have one little postage stamp yep. that you protect it of that whole border, which all probably has minerals. Is this the way well, it's got to be? That it's a good question. Is? If you look across the West, there are now, five, we know about over, over 500,000 abandoned mines scattered across the West, most of them polluting. In Montana and Wyoming, because of a compromise cut in Congress very quietly several years ago, there is a special pot of money for reclaiming mines that comes out of the taxes paid by coal companies, even though these mines are not coal mines. And so gradually, many of these mines, I shouldn't say many, the worst ones are being targeted very slowly to be cleaned up, but that's a fraction of the ones that are out there. I'm talking about future mining proposals around the border. You could be doing what you did over and over and over and over again? Yeah, we could. Yeah. One, of the, one of the fascinating things about Yellowstone is, of course, it's a big volcano, yeah. and it blows up about every 600,000 years, and it's 50,000 years overdue. <laughs> but it, it, it takes in this whole area, and most of these mines are a result of that volcanic action coming up into the earth. Uh, if you could mine Yellowstone, there's, there's gold. We don't talk about it. We shouldn't. But there's gold all through Yellowstone Park because of that volcano. Uh, and so this is always going to be an area that people look at. Uh, right now, the, uh, it's not economically feasible to go back into most of these areas and remine them uh, or clean them up. Uh, it's, it's a legacy that we're, I think we will deal with for many, many years. Um, and, and the government is gradually trying to, to figure that out. And the, and the New World Mine uh, is a good example of how that can be done if you have sufficient money. We spent $25 million and they did, the Forest Service did a great job cleaning the situation up. But that's uh, an exception. You don't even want to like drive by. It's like, wow, it's, it's pretty depressing on the way up to a beautiful place, Copper Harbor. But Lake Linden and Calumet area is completely devastated. And you go up to Calumet now, and that's like the most depressing town in America. Like, I wouldn't want to spend five seconds. I taught there. Sure. <laughs> I wouldn't want to anymore. So yeah, I think you stop. Uh, well, I, I, I think this is, this is the kind of dialogue that you need to have. People need to be able to share different views and find ways to resolve them that's acceptable uh, both to you all locally and to the government, the larger government, whether it's the state or the feds. Uh, and because this is federal land that could be impacted with a wilderness area, I think you have to assume that it, uh, the high standards are going to have to be met if you have a mine going in here. And that, how that's done uh, needs to be thoroughly examined by, by all of you who have a stake in this community. What, what I've laid out is one example. It is not a model. Uh, it is not anything to say should be applied directly here, except to say that uh, we tried to make sure that, that every step of the way, the federal government uh, and the state government uh, imposed stat test and standards for how this thing could be done. And I suggest that that's what's valuable, is not that we won, but that we made that effort uh, as every community should, that's faced with these kinds of choices. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, you know, we, we deal with family structures differently than we deal with industrial operations. And that's the reality of our society. Uh, I don't know if there's a solution to how to deal with sulfides in this part of the world. All I can tell you is I know of no successful examples where, where a, a mine has operated that produces a lot of sulfites uh, where there's not pollution. And maybe people can solve that problem. Uh, I would just suggest that you don't want to start a mine here unless you can be sure that there's a way to solve that problem.